it was my understanding because it's open source that you, uh, that you don't have to just go to cdn.ampproject.org to get your your image tag resolved, or is that not the case? No, it, it is. It, it, so, first of all, the, the, our, our plans for the runtime are, are to have to have you know to support all modern browsers, um, and uh, you know that's very clear and obvious. I'd also point out that, by the way, you can find AMP files surfacing on LinkedIn today. You can find them surfacing on Pinterest today. And yes, you can find them surfacing on Nuzzle today as well. Uh, so they are out there in the wild. But the pages are indeed served by the publisher. I want to keep that in mind because one of the key principles when we built this, I did step back and go through all the key principles. But one key principle was leave the publisher in control of their content, of their page, of their business model. So they're serving these pages. Now, yes, Google will cache these pages uh, so that we can surface them in our canvases. And what we have also stated is that we would make that cache available to any and all comers who wanted to pull the content from the cache, which is a huge boon to many publishers who are now spending. I mean, I one big publisher told me that their largest cost outside of human resources was CDN. And we're basically saying, we're giving you a free CDN. Take advantage of it if you'd like to. Where does the runtime run from, though? I mean, where does... Maybe I'm misunderstanding the technology. Slap me down, Kevin, you're if I am. Aren't you downloading the library into your yeah. browser? Yeah, from where, though? Okay, so... From Google, but you could cache it locally. I mean... You, you could cache it, yeah. but... The, the, the advantage of loading it from Google is that everyone is loading the same one, so that it, it, when you go from yeah. side to side. Yeah. So... All of the JavaScript that, that is allowed comes from a Google server. All of the JavaScript cached. is in the core runtime, yes. Yes. Okay. Because there is there is the opportunity to do JavaScript outside the runtime. Yeah. In prescribed circumstances. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I think that's a problem, but Je come on, Kevin, you're the open web guy. Isn't that a <laughs> that seems to be an issue? To me. Well, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poke back on this, honestly. What's the alternative? What's the alternative to the problem set we're seeing out there in the market? I'll give you one alternative, which some people have pushed back on, which is to, to, you, to encourage people to use much less JavaScript and much more HTML. Um, and that, you know, and that, I understand that is like pushing back against a yeah, lot of more web development. That. Because we that, that means they're taking away capabilities. Yeah, but Richard, this is what it sounds wanna, like to the outs to, to me. It sounds like Google's saying, you guys are crapped up the web. Let us handle this. Run JavaScript. No JavaScript except stuff we provide from our servers is allowed. That is a non-starter with a majority of the world that says Google's an advertising company. Look, that's what you said. That's not what we said. Right? Okay. What we, what we say. Well, how is, is what we, you say different? When we look at the architecture of the web, we see an awful lot of redundancy, right? And so we took an engineering approach which says, how do we optimize this? How do we make things faster? And the most obvious point was, let's look where there's redundancy. And there was a huge amount of redundancy and it was almost entirely in JavaScript, right? And so fine, let's reduce that to core functions that don't take away creativity. So the approach the slide shows, the slideshow module in the runtime is a very basic primitive set of functions that the publisher can compose on top of so that they can make the slideshow look and act and feel the way they would like it to look, act and feel, right? But there's no reason to have, you know, 150,000 different approaches to the very core guts of a slideshow. We can do better than that. But the real, the right answer would be to then push that into HTML itself and have a a, a slideshow element, um, and, and and standardize that. You know, in, in the way, the same way that we've standardized audio and video elements. And so some yes, of the pushback the is that you're you're backing away from the standardized ones and putting your own ones on top of those instead. So I uh, yeah I, I agree a, a slideshow element would be a would be a nice thing to add to HTML and, and maybe this would be a way to to move towards that. Well, and Leo, I think there's a little bit of a middle ground here, which uh, I was running the other week and listening to this week in Google and, and hearing you talking about AMP and you were like, oh, no, this is horrible. And so on the web spam team, often we would run across a case where we'd like to solve something 100%, but maybe you could only solve it 80% for now. And so if 
you can solve the 80% problem of people who have rich content but is relatively static with an open source approach because we all love the open web and we all really want to embrace the open web, you know, then that can help with a ton of publishers, the Washington Posts of the world and, and the New York Times of the world and the Nuzzles of the world. And I take your point because you're a node.js. Like, in some sense, by re-architecting your site, you've just moved toward an API-based system. <laughs> I'm com sort of, completely opposite what this is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the most sophisticated. In some cases, it's the corner case. It's definitely in that 20%. Now, yeah. there are ways where you could use a headless server to sort of say, well, what do... 80% of the people do, they typically hit these 20 pages and you could pre-render those pages and you could convert them into AMP. And I think it's okay if AMP right now doesn't handle 100% of the cases because that's probably not the intent. The intent it is... I mean, as it was said yesterday, you couldn't do Gmail and AMP. Right. No, and yeah. there'll always be a lingscars.com. I understand that. <laughs> uh, but I take your point that you may be chafing a little bit at like, well, Google's got to approve the JavaScript. I think there is a little bit of a trade-off there because you want the JavaScript to be minified and small and compact and standardized, and you don't want bad behavior to creep in. I, I do think, I, and I, what I've heard Richard say is, is that people are open to conversations about how to do better yeah. or what other new things to incorporate and all those sorts of things as well. Don't mistake me. I, I, I understand. I understand where this is coming from, and it's coming from a good place. And Google is, it's very Googly. It's very engineering driven. Look, this is a problem, and the engineer, we know the engineering to solve this problem, and we're going to propose this. But there is, there's this also, there's this appearance problem that often Google is a little tone deaf to the appearance problem, I think. And there's the, the appearance problem. By the way, Facebook and Apple have a similar appearance problem to their proposals uh, in this. You're not alone. And people are saying, well, no one has to do this. But if suddenly you're, you know, all of the fast modern web is AMP, all the cool kids are AMP, you're at a slight, slight disadvantage if you're not at well, AMP. Maybe the pressure you're putting on is the standard body. But, but well, that's I why I, I want to see it a W3C thing. I, I feel like this this needs to be an in, come from an independent standards body. But, but, but Richard, Richard talked about earlier there's an urgency here. I understand Leo. that as well. That's and that's the engineer talking. The engineer well, says, we can both, solve both this. It's a business like with the ad blockers. It's the, it's the rate of growth of ad blockers. And, and notice, by the way, when you download an app page, if you go to g.co slash amp demo, or if you go to Nuzzle and click on a New York Times or a Guardian piece, you'll see that the content loads first, the text loads first, then the photos load, and then the ad will load. But what you see oftentimes is a blank spot. Now, at least the blank spot is now set in a set geography so that or, or architecture so that it doesn't just bounce around. But the reason is a blank spot for a while because the ad is so huge and slow and no, stupid. I, look, it I, puts, you don't it have puts to. Puts pressure on the advertising industry as well. Maybe it also puts pressure on the standards bodies to try to put up better standards. Well, and look at the IAB's response to ad blocking. And you know, I mean, the, this the standard the ad networks don't want to deal with this. They their their answers are very weak to say the least. And well, I understand that they we've gotten ourselves into this problem. I also understand yeah. that. And I use an ad blocker, and probably most of the people, far more than the 40% in Germany, uh, you who are watching and listening to this show use ad blockers. And many of them also use NoScript to block rogue job, to block JavaScript. Um, they're willing to have a very reduced experience of the web because they don't want all that crap. Um, so to them, this would be, I'm sure, positive. Um but at the same well, time, I think there is going to be this uh, issue that it, it feels to it feels to me like a, a private company is is uh, kind of saying, well, "Well, we got a better idea. Let's do this." Well, so, and, so, and another way to think about that, Leo, is think about all the stuff that Google does with Chrome. You know, Chrome launched because yes. Firefox was getting a little slow, yeah, and, and right. it wanted to, to bring and Google Fiber even. You know, even if Google Fiber doesn't reach every single person in the United States, if it acts as a kick, you know, to the back of the pants of some of the, the broadband providers. And even with Chrome, Google has the ability to experiment with some things and see how well they work and iterate really fast on that six-week release cycle. And then afterwards, once you know that this is the best way to do it, then things like uh, Speedy can be incorporated right. into HTTP 2.0. So I... I, I you're, you're, I, I totally get where you're coming from, that you would be worried about any private company, you know, whether it's Facebook or Google, trying to, you know, say, hey, here's the new standard. Everybody adhere to this standard. Well, I particularly should... companies that make their revenue from advertising. Well, okay, so I think that... Because, by the way, this blocks all ads except approved ads. This is an ad blocker. No, it doesn't. Doesn't it? 
But they yeah. block, it blocks certain kinds of ads, like take over the ads we hate that take over the page. It blocks and, and ads that use JavaScript, which is, I think, most of the ads now. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. No, yes, it does. There, there, well, there are paths. There are paths to that. It obviously changes how things are loaded and constructed. But again, it's not about taking about capability. Now, yes, we did. We did build into the runtime certain restrictions with regard to ads, but they're very basic, and I don't think anyone would argue with them given the objectives of the project. One was, yes, load the content first, the ad second. Frankly, it'd be great if they can become close to simultaneous, but one of the issues in the ecosystem today is there's no transparency about yeah, the performance no, of the ad that. systems. Yep. You know, none at all. We also say that the ads have to communicate at predetermined size so that we can eliminate the jankiness. And we also say that ads can't reach outside the document, meaning eliminate pop-ups. Okay, we've eliminated pop-ups. Yay! Well, but wait a minute, because most ads also have some JavaScript associated with it. Uh, that JavaScript will not be allowed to run. Right, well, the, the point is that they're trying to um, uh, box out a class of ads that, that will be allowed. So it, it, in this, um, for it, for it to pass the AMP validation, then it has to not have JavaScript in, apart from JavaScript that's, that's been loaded um, secondarily through the um, the core AMP JavaScript. Right, and I'm sure all of uh, Google's ads are compliant. Yes, yeah, I'm sure they're not actually. Oh. Not, not, no, not no. literally. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> you know, but there there too. I mean, the idea is there's you know there's no restrictions or or demands that, that, that people use our ad technology or anyone specific ad technology. We're adding more ad networks are supporting AMP every day. Good. All right. uh, clearly the ad industry has to evolve its own sense of how to create and deliver compelling advertising. If AMP did nothing else but that, we should celebrate it.